Hello everyone, today is going to be a short video, I just want to talk a bit about the arrival of the Yayoi in Japan, about the transitional period between the two, the two eras, so that we don't fall straight in, into the Yayoi period without context in the next video of the series, and also to address some final topics, vaguely related to the Jomon period, and one in particular that might not be related but that also has no connection to any other period in Japanese history. So the topics we are going to cover today are the arrival of the Yayoi, the Jomon language, Jomon influences today, and the ruins of Yonaguni. Feel free to jump to any of these topics with the timestamps and the chapters I've indexed. Without further ado, let's get started. As mentioned in the last video, a Korean culture, Mumu, began to influence Jomon communities during the final phase of the Jomon period, especially those living in Kyushu, the region closest to the straits separating Korea and Japan. The enrichment of the area contributed to the later formation of the Yamato Empire, and this was one of the most important events in Japanese history. We could even say that it was the beginning of Japan as we know it today, but we will talk about it in another time. Contact between Japan and Korea didn't just begin at this stage. It is thought that there was already trade between the mainland and the archipelago from quite early on, early Jomon, but it was the increase in this contact that led to the changes in the Jomon camps. Korean influence began to take hold in northern Kyushu around 900 BC. Pottery dating back to 800 BC, found in archaeological sites in this region, appears to have been created in a style similar to that which the Mumu used to make their pottery. Rice cultivation began in the basin downstream of Yangtze River approximately 8,000 years ago. I also talked about this in the previous video. And shortly afterwards, rice cultivation was joined by the cultivation of other cereals, such as millet and foxtail millet. The practice then spread throughout Asia. The Mumu were a society that practiced agriculture and were therefore responsible for introducing it to the Jomon. Rice was first cultivated in dry riverbeds and swamps and later by transplanting seedlings into rice paddies. It took a few centuries for the procedure to become organized and efficient. It wasn't overnight that rice fields became, came to dominate Japan's landscape. Not least because growing rice requires a great deal of control over water management, and achieving this control didn't happen overnight. Rice farming was not the Mumun's only contribution to Jomon society. They were also responsible for the introduction of new types of tomb, the dolmen, new weaving techniques, and bronze and iron metallurgy. Studies based on the carbon radio method suggest that the Yayoi period began between 500 and 300 BC, but you can consider this period as, as, a, as a transitional phase. In the north of Japan, in Tuoku and Hokkaido, the Mumun influence was felt to a lesser degree, which paved the way for the later emergence of the Imichi and Ainu cultures. The arrival of the Yayoi era brought with it several waves of, of immigration from the Korean peninsula. This was because Korea was going through a period of political instability, known as the Three Kingdoms period. The Chinese also have a period with the same name, but we are talking about the Korean one. At that time, which lasted from 57 BCE to 668 CE, the Korean peninsula was divided into three rival kingdoms, Goguryeo, Bakshi and Silla. The insane conflicts resulting from the power struggle between the three kingdoms meant that many people sought refuge and safety in neighboring countries, including Japan. Who knows? Maybe one day I will cover the history of Korea and then we can delve deeper into this theme of the three kingdoms. Several archaeological discoveries point to the existence of this transitional period between the two eras. One of them is, as already mentioned, the style of the ceramics that the Jomon created during their last years which already has similarities with Yayoi ceramics, more uniform, practical, appropriate for an agricultural society. These characteristics emerge partially as a result of the Mumu influence. Ritualistic tutelation, a practice that emerged during the Jomon period and extended into the Yayoi period, 
I thought it did extracted and the meaning of the extraction changed over time might have originated on the mainland, since it also occurred in ancient China. Finally, genetic studies also provide information about the Jomon Yayoi transition, because they show that during this phase, there was a major change in the genetics of the individuals, something that can basically only be explained by migrations, and not rare and occasional migrations, but large-scale migrations. It is not known which linguas or languages were spoken in Japan during the Jomon period. It is only possible to speculate on the matter. The hypotheses are Ainu languages, or earlier forms of the current Ainu language, Japonic languages, Austronesian languages, and unique languages that have since died out. The Ainu language is often equated with the Jomon language. According to this theory, the Ainu languages originated in the central region of Honshu, and, like the Jomon culture itself, were pushed north towards Hokkaido, where they survived till the 20th century. Due to the colonization policy employed by the Japanese government, the number of Ainu speakers decreased dramatically, and today it is considered an endangered language. Although this is a popular view, it is not uncontroversial, and not everyone accepts it. This is because it is likely that the Jomon languages were the result of an amalgamation of several different language families from many different places. In technical terms, because there is no academic consensus, the origin of the Ainu language is unknown. Moving on to the Japonic languages, what exactly are those? The Japonic languages are a language family that includes Japanese, spoken on the main islands of Japan, and the Ryukyuan languages, spoken on the Ryukyu Islands. This family also includes the Ashizo language, spoken on the Izu Islands. Most scholars believe that the Japanese language was brought, to, was brought to the archipelago from the Korean peninsula and that it flourished during the Yayoi period. But some linguistics suggest that the Japonic languages were already present in Japan and even on the Korean coast much earlier and that they were instead linked to the Jomon populations of southwest Japan. Finally, the Austronesian languages. The Austronesian languages are a language family particularly widespread in maritime Southeast Asia, but which also can be found in parts of mainland Southeast Asia, Madagascar, the islands of the Pacific Ocean and Taiwan, where it is spoken by indigenous people. Some suggest that Austronesian speakers arrived in Japan during the Jomon period, before the arrival of immigrants from the Korean Peninsula and that they were assimilated by the Jomon. Therefore, the Austronesian languages could have had an influence. In conclusion, what language did the Jomon speak? Nobody knows for sure. And I know that this might lead to some discussion. There might be people in the comments who will say it's definitely this because of that, or that it's definitely that because of this. But what I, me, personally, have observed during my studies, and just to remind you, my studies are superficial, it's always good to keep that in mind, is that, is that there really is no definitive answer. So probably not Japanese, because it is believed to date back to the Yayoi period, maybe languages related to what is now the Hainu language, maybe languages that have completely died out, only the Jomon know, and they are not here to tell. Something I also found interesting is the hypothesis that some experts put forward that the influence of the Jomon language might be preserved in today's Japanese language. The Japanese language uses a lot of onomatopoeia, especially when it comes to nature and its elements. In addition to this linguistic feature, there is a tradition, particularly in deep rural, rural Japan, of collecting wild vegetables in the spring and mushrooms in the fall, a custom that might be linked to the Jomon. In recent decades, Japanese interest in the Jomon has been growing. Patterns and designs reminiscent of the era have been applied to various areas, from clothing to packaging, and exhibitions about the Jomon period in museums have been attracting more and more visitors. Experts have made efforts to reconstruct Jomon pottery using ancient techniques, and 17 Jomon archaeological sites in northern Japan were added to the World Cultural Heritage List in July 2021. 
On top of all of this, six objects discovered in excavations and belonging to the Jomon period have been designated as national treasures as of 2018, with Jomon Venus having been the first to receive such a designation in 1995. Let's look at some examples of people who were inspired by the Jomon era. Hyonozuki Okazai studied design at Tokyo University of the Arts and for his graduation thesis exhibition, he created a series of costumes entitled Jomon Jomon, inspired by the ceramics and ritualistic beliefs of the Jomon era. Taku Oshima, a Japanese master of the black work technique, is also very interested in triple tattoos, particularly those of the Ainu and the Jomon. Thus, his full body tattoos are very much inspired by the Jomon era. The abstract avant garde paintings and statues of the late Taro Okamoto, a famous 20th century artist, was also inspired by Jomon art. Okamoto became intrigued by Jomon ceramics on a visit to the Tokyo National Museum, and this experience motivated him to travel all over Japan to learn about the culture. Amade Soji and his student Simaoka Tatsuzo created Jomon ceramic pieces for teaching purposes. Later, Shimaoka created a new ceramic decoration technique called Jomon Inlay. Yanagi Muneyoshi, Japanese philosopher and also founder of the Minge art movement, and textile artist Serizawa Keizuki were also found of the Jomon period. Another Jomon enthusiast was the late Nobel Prize winning writer Yuza Nari Kawabata, who had a dogu on his desk. It was a gloomy figure with a heart shaped face, and Kawabata said of his dogu, it's sitting in front of my sheet of paper and talking to me. As you can see, the examples are countless. Let me now talk about the subject that I thought it doesn't have to do with Jomon deserves to be discussed. I'm sure you have heard of Atlantis, right? Atlantis is an island that was mentioned in the work Timaeus and Critias by the Greek philosopher Plato. In these works, it is described as having been a naval empire located beyond the pillars of Hercules, and which tried to conquer ancient Athens, and therefore fell into disgrace, being submerged in the Atlantic Ocean as a consequence. According to Plato, all this would have happened more than 9,000 years before his time. Some ancient writers saw Atlantis as an allegory for arrogance, but others believed that it really existed, which led to various expeditions to find it over the years. The term Atlantis has also become a kind of synonym for any submerged prehistoric civilization whose origin is unknown, whether it is in the Atlantic Ocean or not. Today it is widely accepted that Atlantis is a myth, something Plato created to convey a message but there is still debate about what inspired the ancient Greek philosopher. Even so, there has been so much discussion that Atlantis appears again and again in contemporary fiction, films, songs, paintings, etc. Well, all of this to say that Japan also has its own Atlantis. The official name of this Atlantis is Yonaguni structures, and as the name suggests, they are located off the island of Yonaguni, under the Arakawabana cliff. Yonaguni Jima is an island off the southern tip of Japan's Ryukyu Okinawan archipelago, about 75 miles 120 kilometers, off the eastern coast of Taiwan. They were discovered in the 1980s by Kiyashiro Arataki, director of the Yonaguni Show Tourism Association, who wanted to observe hammerhead sharks, which are common in the area, thanks to the Yo. Naguni structures, a promontory of the island was renamed Izeki Hanto, which means point of ruins. In total, these formations cover an area of 300 meters by 150 meters, 984 feet by 492 feet for the Americans in the audience, and consist of 10 structures of Yonaguni and an additional 5 a little further away of the main island of Okinawa. Japanese marine geologist Masaaki Kimura believes that the submerged stone structures are actually the ruins of an ancient city sunk by an earthquake around 2,000 years ago, a city that will date back at least 5,000 years, based on the dates of stalactites found inside underwater caves that he believes sank with the city. 
Masaaki Kimura is also Professor Emeritus of the Faculty of Science at the University of Ryukyu, Okinawa. He has been diving at the site to measure and map its formations for over 15 years. Upon hearing the discovery, Kimura admits that his first reaction was, was disbelief. The formations could be natural. But after the first dive, his position changed. I think it's very difficult to explain their origin as purely natural, due to the large amount of evidence of man's influence on the structures, says Kimura. Examples of these influences include markings on the stone, which appear to be characters, and rocks carved in the likeness of animals. The largest structure looks like a complicated monolithic stepped pyramid rising from a depth of 25 meters, explains the geologist. The animal characters and monuments, which I managed to partially recover in my laboratory, suggest that the culture came from the Asian continent. As for when the civilization ended up underwater, Kimura has a theory about that too. In April 1771, a huge tsunami with an estimated height of more than 40 meters hit Yonaguni. This is not surprising. After all, Yonaguni is in a place of intense seismic activity. Kimura believes that such phenomena may also have fallen on the ancient civilization, causing it to sink. This drawing represents the ruins of Yonaguni and comes from Professor Kimura's academic research paper. The notations were made by Florin, a diver who has a blog called World Adventure Divers, and who records her experience in the ruins of Yonaguni. Yes, the site can be visited, but only by experienced divers, as the currents are strong. The, the ruins include what appears to be an ark, five temples and a large stadium, all connected by roads and water canals, and partially protected by walls. Also found were a triangular pool-like structure, two post holes, an entrance, ditches, stairs, a turtle-shaped rock, terraces and a rock inscription with what appear to be characters. Kimura also claims that every time he visits the alleged ruins, he comes back more convinced that they are the remains of a lost ancient city. That's why he presented his theories at a scientific conference, but his statement sparked controversy. Robert Scotch, professor of science and mathematics at Boston University, who dived to observe the site, says the following. The first time I dived there, I knew it was not artificial. It's not as regular as many people claim, and the right angles and symmetry don't add up in many places. I'm not convinced that any of the major features of structures are man-made steps or terraces. It's basic geology and classic stratigraphy for sandstones, which tend to break along plants and give you these very straight edges, particularly in an area with lots of faults and tectonic activity. He suggests that the holes that Kimura believes were used to support poles were merely created by underwater whirlpools, and that the lines of smaller holes were formed by sea creatures exploiting the cracks in the rocks. As for the animal figures and characters, Scotch believes that they are natural scratches and shapes, and that they are being interpreted as something they are not. A bit like when we see shapes in clouds, I imagine. American author John Anthony West visited the structures with Scotch and agreed that it was a natural formation and that Kimura had not looked closely enough at the natural processes at work. German geologist Wolf Wichmann, who studied the formations in 1999 during an expedition organized by Spiegel TV and in 2001, at the invitation of Graham Hancock, also concluded that they could have been formed by natural processes. Neither the Japanese Government Agency for Cultural Affairs nor the Okinawa Prefectural Government recognized the Yonaguni structures as a cultural asset. As such, the Yonaguni district officially owns the formations, and it is thanks to this that tourists and researchers can dive freely at the site. But Kimura also has supporters. Toru Oshi, Associate Professor of Seismology at Kobe University, supports Kimura's hypothesis. Oshi stated that he has never seen tectonic activity have such an effect on a landscape, both above and below the water. I also dived there and touched the pyramid. What Professor Kimura says is not at all exaggerated. It's easy to see that those, rel that those relics weren't caused by earthquakes. Despite the criticism, Kimura remains optimistic that time will reveal that his theories are correct. For now, however, they are considered to be pseudo-archaeological. 
In fact, the most recent studies carried out at the site 2019 using digital technology conducted by Takayuki Ogata and other researchers pretty much confirmed that the alleged ruins were produced by processes of weathering and erosion, and that something similar occurred at the geo site of Sani Nudai, also located on the island of Yonaguni. In conclusion, even if it turns out beyond doubt that the ruins are indeed natural, this wouldn't make them any less impressive. Because, if you think about it, the hypotheses are, on one end, the remains of a long-forgotten civilization, or, in the other, a demonstration of the incredible power of nature. It makes you wonder what else is hidden in the depths of the sea. That concludes today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. The next videos are going to be a little different. I'm not going to tell you what they are about, because that would spoil the surprise, but I can assure you that they are very original. I can almost say that these videos I'm going to make next, that, um, that there's no one who's done anything like this on the whole YouTube. It's a bold statement, but I would almost bet my channel that it's true. I thought anyway, YouTube is very big, so I can confirm this. Now, just because the videos are original, it doesn't mean that they are good, interesting, whatever you want to call it. But something nice might came out of it. Uh, without trying, I will never know. So, see you later and take care.